Hey everyone, Christopher Paolini here, and we're doing round number two, three, something like that, of uh, Q&A from social media. So uh, again, I'd want to thank you for sending so many awesome questions. I know I'm just scratching the surface of the many, many uh, ones that you submitted, but uh, I'll keep uh, plowing my way through them as I can. And again, thank you for submitting. Uh, Christopher, good name. Um, I mean, there's a lot of them, uh, especially in the Inheritance Cycle, but also in To Sleep in a Sea of Stars. As far as characters, Safira, I mean, she's the reason I started writing Aragon in the first place. Uh, Arya was always fun to write. A uh, Elva, how oh, I loved writing Elva's scenes. Um, as far as scenes themselves, uh, there's so many ones that I had fun uh, with or that touched me emotionally. You know, when Sephira breaks the star sapphire at the end of the first book, uh, when Aragon and Sephira are flying to Vroengard and they see the curve of the world, um, when Aragon and Runin make Brissinger in <laughs> our <laughs> this, this book of the same title. So uh, lots and lots of scenes and characters like that. Into Sleep in a Sea of Stars, um, when Kira finds the artifact that she finds, uh, the escape that she and the Wallfish crew have from Orsted Station. Uh, <laughs> some, some, some of the scenes with Grigorovich. Oh, I loved writing Grigorovich. So it's hard to pick and choose because I attempt to mostly write characters and scenes and stories that appeal to me on a deep level in every part of the story. Because um, if I don't like what I'm writing, why am I writing it? And why would what someone want to read it? Arya. Because even though you said no magic, uh, elves still have a physical advantage. And I even if you were to say that Arya was reduced to base human level reflexes and strength, she's still a trained warrior who has been fighting and, and practicing and training for basically a hundred some years uh, and, and has has put those skills into use and not just practice, she's been in fights and had to defend herself during that time many times. And that is just an insurmountable skill gap, I think. Uh, Nasawada does not train like a warrior uh, for the most part. She does train, she does practice, she's good with a bow, but uh, especially later in the series, She's working on her statesmanship and keeping things from falling apart a lot more than she is spending hours, you know, with a sword or a bow. So uh, I think that Nasawada is certainly the equal of Arya, if not her match when it comes to per strength of personality and intelligence. But in a straight up fight, Arya's got it every day. Does Alagazia exist in the fractal verse? Great question. No comment. Uh, well, first of all, I'm delighted to hear that you and others are excited to participate in the show in one way or another. Uh, I am going to be deeply involved in pretty much all aspects of the show, I hope. Uh, this is, I think, our best opportunity to get a good adaptation of Aragon and the other books in the Inheritance Cycle. As far as casting itself, we're not at that stage yet, but when we are, the best way to participate will be to pay attention to you know, casting call websites, there will be a casting director for the show, uh, and just in general, everything's going to need to go through official channels. So don't send your audition tapes to me, send them to the casting director or to the website. Uh, find your way, find the way to actually submit. Disney Plus and Disney in general is, um, you know, it's a large company. They have a very certain way of doing things and uh, kind of have to play in the rules with that. But again, thank you for your enthusiasm, and I hope you get the chance. I'd love to film it here in Montana, at least some of it, where it's appropriate. Uh, Montana has absolutely beautiful landscape, and it's underutilized. I mean, the state is named after the mountains. Uh, of course, a lot of projects are filmed elsewhere in the world because of tax breaks there, and that's just the way it is. Um, you know, a lot of times when you see mountains, they're up in British Columbia, or they're filming in Budapest, or the Czech Republic, or, or elsewhere. So, again, I'd love to film quite a bit more stuff in Montana. I think it would be a beautiful thing to do. But in general, we'll look for the best landscapes, 
and of course a lot of them will have to be CG. There are no 10 mile high mountains in reality. No, all of the actors I originally had in mind are too old now. Uh, you know, it is what it is. I have types of actors in mind, and that would guide, you know, my thought process on the topic. But especially with Aragon, you know, I've seen some recommendations over the years of this person or that person. And unfortunately, a lot of times, by the time someone is actually established enough to say, oh yes, he'd be the one, they're already a little too old for the role. And, and that's going to be a conversation I'll be having with Disney is exactly how old the actor maybe should be, you know, in casting this. Because you need someone who's old enough to properly convey the role, but at the same time, it is a coming-of-age story. And if you cast someone who's too old in the role, they're already grown up. There is no coming-of-age. And no matter how well how the role is written, part of your brain will still be looking at the person saying, yeah, but they look like they're 25 or 30, um, you know. It's the problem when you get actors like of that age cast in high school roles. So that'll be the balancing act. Um, and of course, the difficulty casting someone who's under 18 is the labor laws make that, um, you know, difficult to film long hours with them. Well, you can't film long hours with them. So all of that will be a conversation with Disney. Uh, I can't point to anyone specific and say, that's Aragon or that's Murtag or that's Roran. But there are definitely types I have in mind, and that's what I'll be looking for. Thank you. I, I would love to see some video games, more some more video games set in the world of Aragon. Uh, we did have a couple of video games that were tied into the film that shall not be named. Uh, so I wouldn't be surprised if Disney pursued that. Uh, they do that with their successful projects, and if we have a successful television show, I can't think of any reason that there wouldn't be some some video games in one form or another. And not just video games, perhaps other forms of games also. The, the chance is not zero, and I'm, like so many fantasy fans, I like a nice leather-bound, gilt-edged, beautiful edition. Trust me, I've had this in my mind for a long time, uh, that it would be nice to do this. So, uh, the chance is not zero. Uh, we may have some news on that at some point. <laughs> uh, great question. No comment. Not only can it merge with any animal, it can merge with any um, plant as well. Basically, any organic material of a sufficient size. So it's not going to merge with a bacteria or a, you know, single-celled organism, unless the single-celled organism was, you know, absolutely gigantic. And I'm thinking of a certain Star Trek episode here. Um, you know, space amoeba, amoeba essentially. Uh, but no, it has the capability to merge itself with organic material basically any type. Uh, it would not choose, under normal circumstances, to merge with, let's say, a tree or a dog, but it could happen under the right circumstances. Because again, the, the soft blade has a certain amount of intelligence, I mean, it's very intelligent actually, and so it can make choices. It does have also, you know, programming rules, essentially, that guide what it does and can't do, but as we even see in the, the events of To Sleep in a Sea of Stars, that programming, that behavior can get corrupted, in which case it's difficult to predict what will happen. I mean, there's a couple of ways to go about it. One would be to first get a sense of what it is you're trying to accomplish. Uh, if you're, you know, maybe you have a feel certain feeling in mind, like you want really, you know, um, archaic, arcane, involved magic. And you know you want lots of scrolls and, and lots of diagrams. And, you know, that, that might be something that's guiding your thought process. Or it might be that you have an idea for how you want to break physics and how you want to change physics. Like, you know, what if the nuclear by force was this? Or what if, you know, this was different? Or what if that were different? Um, and that could then, and then you can work out all the implications of that change to reality as we know it. So in the case of the inheritance cycle, my uh, alteration of physics was the assumption that 
living creatures and specifically, you know, animals and, and sentient creatures to a degree. And by sentience, I, I mean, I would even say, you know, animals, that they can control energy with their minds. You know, that's, that's the jump of logic. That's the leap of logic, uh, the leap of faith <laughs> I'm asking the readers to make. And then everything else sort of follows from that as, as just trying to work out the implications of that. Uh, so that's kind of the same thing I did with my technology in To Sleep in a Sea of Stars. It was like, where am I going to break physics? Well, I want faster than light travel. Okay, how do I make that happen and what are the implications? Uh, if, if I were going to create a magic system from scratch now, I probably would start with the feeling that I'm going for instead of, you know, actually th saying, oh, I'm going to break physics in this way. I probably would start with a feeling of, yeah, I want to do a really, you know, complicated, intricate system. Or I want it to be based on gods. You know, everyone has to pray to a god or gods in different ways, and you get different effects as a result. And then how would that work, realistically? Uh, that's, that's the main thing, ultimately, for me, is whatever you go with is making sure your characters think about it in the way that we would, you know, that asking the same questions we would have like, well, is this possible? Can I do this? Yeah. <laughs> because if they don't ask those questions, you know the readers are going to ask those questions and they'll get frustrated if they see the characters ignoring obvious solutions or uh, problems. When I started, I would just have a bunch of Word files. I'd usually have one that was devoted to people, places, and things, and then another file that was devoted to languages. And as I wrote, I tried to record a lot of the stuff I was creating. Uh, I was not particularly consistent with it in the beginning, which resulted in a lot of work down the road many years later. But uh, these days, uh, <laughs> I'm very fortunate I was able to have my a wonderful assistant, Emanuela, uh, build me a personal Wikipedia, essentially, for both the Inheritance Cycle and the Fractal Verse. And so what I do now is, as I'm writing a story, I usually have a, a page for the book that is in the wiki, and I just fill it out with characters, places, things, languages, whatever needs to be recorded. And I don't put a lot of information, I just put a bunch of links uh, for you know, let's say Kira uh, from To Sleep in a Sea of Stars. I'll just put her name as a link, and it goes to a blank page. And after the book is finished, and by finished I mean actually published, then we can go back in and fill out those pages. Uh, the reason that isn't done, you know, earlier in the process is because stuff changes during editing, and sometimes it's, you know, important stuff. So you, there's no point in filling out all those pages if everything's gonna, everything's still fungible. Uh, it's an amazing resource to have, and even if you're just doing this with, you know, text documents or Word files, it's, I highly, highly recommend doing it. It's worth the effort because you lose track of stuff, or at least I do. You know, if you have a lot of characters in your books, and if you have a series which keeps introducing new characters, and places, and things, and languages, it gets difficult to impossible to hold it all in your mind. And the longer you go on in a certain series or world, the harder it gets to remember what you did back years and years ago. Uh, I know with To Sleep in a Sea of Stars, there were some 50-some speaking characters in the book, give or take. Uh, that's a lot of characters to keep track of, even if they only appear for a line or two. So uh, it, it is one of those things I've become much more rigorous with over the years and it saves a lot of work staying on top of it. The most challenging thing about creating the ancient language is that I'm not actually a linguist. So I, <laughs> I was um, sort of feeling my way through the process and doing the best I could with uh, the skills I have and the knowledge I had when I started the inheritance cycle. Uh, I think the biggest difficulty was when I realized just how complicated creating a language could be. And I actually had to step back from it and say, how much of myself and how much of my time and energy am I willing to invest in this process? And, the, I, and I remember the exact moment this struck me. It, it was when I really grasped the fact that 
words don't just come out of thin air. Every word, and I, I mean in the real world, as well as invented worlds, every word has a history. Every word comes from somewhere. And that somewhere traces all the way back to the beginning of time and beyond recorded history. And you can take any, any ordinary word, and as you trace its history, you'll find that you're tracing the history of the world itself. So, you know, when they say that Tolkien created Middle-earth and the history of Middle-earth basically to support his languages, I think there's some real truth in that. Um, so when I, when I really grasped that, you know, I had to say, what am I willing to do? How, much, how many years am I willing to invest in this? Um, so I did what I could. And uh, I'm very proud of the result, and I love the sound of the ancient language. Uh, I think there's some really neat words in there and sentences and some interesting grammar here and there. But uh, it's, it's one of those things where I literally could have devoted my life to trying to master linguistics. And of course, there are people who do that and are masters of it. And I take my hat off to them because it's an amazing field of study. But there was a group of graduate students, I believe, who in... Uh, was it Denmark? It might have been Denmark, uh, who actually put together a paper that expanded on the ancient language in a very scholarly fashion and built it out more using what I, had, what I established and then saying logically, according to the laws of linguistics and languages and things we know, how else might it function and how else might we expand it? And uh, they gave me permission. We actually have that paper posted up on my website, paulini.net, uh, which I encourage you to go check it out if uh, languages are interesting to you.